Okay, welcome guys. Um, today we are going to talk about pollination. Um, <clears throat> so we'll start off just looking at our upcoming events. Um, obviously Tunnel Talk is gonna be the top because it is my favorite. Um, so May 1st, we're going to be looking at biological spray programs. Um, so our berry specialist, Sunny Murray, has put together a, um, a spray guide um, that's going to be primarily for strawberries. Um, and then I'll be looking at one for tomato, just because those are kind of the main commodities that we're seeing under protection. Um, a lot of these products do have very wide wide labels, excuse me. So I do think that you would be able to use a lot of those in other um, in other crops as well. Um, I'm playing around with the idea of sort of adding a second set of meetings, um, kind of coining them as a round table or office hours. Um, I think with the programming that we've put together so far, it's been pretty sort of presenter heavy and um, sort of webinar style heavy. And I kind of thought that having that second opportunity would be great to have it a bit more sort of grower focused, production focused. What are we seeing on the farm? Um, there wouldn't really be any content um, prepared for that one. It would be more just show up and we'll have a chat. So I think we might give that a try for May 15th. Um, if you don't have anything to bring, that's fine. You don't have to show up, but it'll kind of just be like a standing space for you guys to use um, if you want to. And then June 12th, we have a, our topic is going to be ventilation in greenhouses. So we have someone, um, he set up a very interesting and labor intensive experiment with ventilation in different spaces and how that impacts temperature. So I think that's going to be a really cool session as well. Um, Horticulture Nova Scotia um, is doing an irrigation session on April 9th at Spur Brothers Farms. Um, this is going to be more focused towards field production, but I think most people sort of dabble in both. So I thought it would be worth mentioning here. Um, and then we're doing an online tutorial for our new online pest management guides on April 10th. That's a virtual event. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about the new spray guides in the May 1st meeting, um, but for like a more thorough, how do we use it? Look at the functionality of it. Um, I think April 10th is going to be the one for you. Um, in the past, if you're not familiar with our spray guides, it's typically just been a Word document that we very tediously update once a year. Um, but now we have a much more user friendly format so you can actually search. So if you're looking for, you know, a product that you can use against botrytis in, say, cucumber and tomato, then you can kind of put all those things in and it will spit out a list versus previously it was like, take my tomato guide and my cucumber guide and search for the powdery mildew section and then kind of, or botrytis section and then try to find a product that matches up. So this should be much better. Um, you can also print your selections. So if you say, you know, you have your list, that's great on those two crops. I can just print that off or you can print the whole thing. So super cool. Um, and then the last plug I've got for you today is that we're doing a series of introductory sprayer training sessions. Um, those will be held um, basically every Thursday through the month of April from 9 a.m. to 12, not 12 a.m., 12 p.m. Don't worry, that was my mistake. Um, so we have our first one happening in Coldbrook uh, next week, and then it'll be Bible Hill and Babu. Um, so this is just a great sort of refresher um, for those who haven't been spraying in a while. Um, you need sprayers for both beneficial and conventional products. So this is just a really great free event uh, to get your pesticide points and then just to make sure that you've got everything that you need. Um, just a quick perennia update. Um, so we have our previous vegetable specialist, Tim Morcom. He's taking a one year leave to finish his master's degree. Um, and so in the meantime, our molecular biologist, Matthew Pyle, is going to be stepping in. Um, he covered uh, Rosie's maternity leave a few years ago, and he worked as the berry specialist for a year as well. So he definitely has experience in that realm. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out to him if you have any questions. Um, and just a final reminder that our off-calf program applications are open. Um, the intake closes pretty soon if you haven't already got it in, but you're hoping to. 
Um, so check out offcaf.prenia.ca if you're interested in that or reach out to our technical lead, um, Georgia. Anyways, so with that, we are going to attempt to switch to our feature presentation. So uh, thanks, Talia. Uh, Talia um, I'm Andrea Ketty and I work with Copert. We are a company that does uh, beneficial insects for greenhouse agriculture type crops. Bumblebees are one aspect that we do. We also work with predators, parasites, beneficial insects for hunting down the pests in the crop. But today's focus is pollination with bumblebees. So let's get into that and hope that this is just going to. Talia, can you do the uh, skip through the slides there for me? Are you able to do that? Or do I need to do that on mine? I think I'm able to do that for you here. So yeah, just give me the cue if I'm <laughs> if I'm okay. too slow. There we go. I think we both have it now, actually. All right. So pollination, just in general, um, pollination is the transfer of pollen from the anthers of the flower to the stigma of the flower. Um, pretty well, most flowers are going to require some type of insect, many of the times bumblebees or flies, to transfer that pollen. And bumblebees themselves have specialized techniques to do this pollen transfer. And a big one that is focused on with them is buzz pollination. And we'll get into what that specifically is, but what it does is it really effectively releases the pollen from the flowers. Let's get the, there we go. So the benefits of bumblebees, um, they're native to Canada, so they're really well adapted for the climate that we have here. And they're active basically from sunrise to, to, to dusk, seven days a week. They're not going to take any days off unless it's terrible conditions. Um, they are going to continue foraging at really low temperatures, as low as about 10 degrees Celsius. That's more or less that benchmark there. And on cloudy days, windy days, upwards of 64 kilometers an hour, not that that is happening in the greenhouse all that often, but that's one of the advantages that they have for outdoor conditions is that they don't really mind cruddy days with not much sunlight. Um, bees in their flight pattern, they tend to hang around close to the hive for the most part. They're not going 10 kilometers down the road. So that can be a big advantage to the grower uh, because basically they're going to be focused on those crops that are more close to their brood as opposed to going out and necessarily chasing down the best, highest quality pollen. So you can control where their, uh, what their focus is for pollination. Physically, they have very hairy bodies and a very large size. So this allows bumblebees to carry a pretty large pollen load from plant to plant in contrast to some of the other pollinators that might be out there. And when you're working with them in the greenhouse, this is fairly important. Um, they're not a very aggressive insect to be working around and they're quite easy to use. So you don't have too, too many worries about uh, workers getting stung unless we create those types of conditions where they want to sting the, the workers. Let's get next there. So buzz pollination specifically, um, this is an advantage that bumblebees have. So within a flower, pollen is not always easily accessible to the pollinating insects. And that just comes down to the structure of the flower itself. So a bumblebee, when they use buzz pollination, what they're doing is they go and grab the flower. They have mandibles in their mouth part to latch onto the flower. And then they contract their flight muscles and produce some really strong vibrations. And this is what allows the pollen grains to actually just fall out onto their bodies. So then the pollen is released. It's covering their hairy, hairy bodies. And they use their legs to comb that pollen from their hairs into the pollen baskets on the hind legs. Um, during this whole process, there's a lot of pollen transfer that's happening just by default of them gathering the pollen in this way. Tomatoes, blueberries, eggplants, kiwis, not that we're growing tons of those in Canada, but those are really good examples of flowers that really benefit from this type of pollination and that comes down to the flower structure in itself. <clears throat> so for you, the grower, some of the benefits that you'll see from using pollination 
is you're typically going to see an increase in yield, uniformity, size, and the quality of fruits. So we're really talking about getting more number ones. Um, that's a higher value, of course, to you, the grower. And the, another nice benefit is it often actually increases the post-harvest shelf life of those fruits due to increased um, stronger cell walls. Prior to the use of bumblebees in tomato greenhouses, pollination was usually done manually by workers using a handheld electric vibrator. It was very labor intensive, took a lot of work and quite expensive. Once we started introducing bumblebees into the greenhouse, this was going back quite some time, uh, those bumblebees really helped to reduce those manual labor costs and it actually significantly improved the overall success of the pollen transfer, increasing the fruit weight, size, and quality. So there's basically what I'm getting at is bumblebees are extremely effective at getting good pollen transfer, transfer to have a high quality uniform pollination throughout the entire crop, much better than humans do. Okay, next. So cross-pollination versus self-pollination. Um, in general, cross-pollination is the more common method for plants to be reproducing. And even plants that are capable of self-pollination are quite happy to cross-pollinate whenever they're able to. In truly self-pollinated plants, usually what you'll see is the smallers are, sorry, the flowers are much smaller. Um, they'll be less colorful or scented and a lot less pollen grains produced. And that more or less just makes sense if the plant doesn't need to spend the energy to attract pollinators, then they're going to have a different flower structure. Now, tomatoes, I'm gonna talk a bit about tomatoes because that's of course one of the big ones that we do in the greenhouse. Tomatoes are capable of self-pollination, but the anthers that are trying to release that pollen, they're non-dihiscent. So basically what that means is they don't really easily release that pollen without some kind of a vibration. That's one of the reasons that they are quite successful in that particular crop. Now, in contrast, greenhouse cucumbers, the seedless varieties that we grow, those have a parthenocarpic type flower. So we don't see any yield or quality increase with pollination in that type of a crop. And so the reason I mention that is because if we're going to evaluate whether it's worth putting pollinators into the crop, it's really crop dependent. Um, and just knowing what the flower structure and what those advantages are going to be for the crop. The ones that we're commonly using, um, apple, cherry, pear, cranberry, blueberry, raspberry, blackberry, melon, squash, and pumpkin, cucumbers in the field, uh, strawberries and tomatoes. Now of the ones that we use the most here, it's we're looking primarily at the tomatoes and the strawberries. Um, and some of the others that, sorry, blueberries should be on this list, but there it is. That comes down to strawberries and tomatoes grown in the greenhouse. Uh, the bumblebees are uh, much better adapted to that greenhouse environment and can be really consistent throughout the entire year with that and applying the, the hives in the correct way to have really consistent pollination over the entire year of that greenhouse crop. In blueberries, the advantage is really the flowering period is so early into the year that there's not much for native pollinators at that time. And if we're having kind of a cool, windy, rainy spring, we'll still have some really good action out of the bumblebees for pollination in that particular crop. So we're looking at what time is the crop flowering? What is the flower structure? And what are those advantages? <clears throat> So when it comes to bumblebees and their foraging behavior, uh, the butts pollination, that allows a bumblebee to pollinate a flower in just one single visit. In contrast, typically a honeybee needs to visit a flower about seven to 10 times before it's pollinated. And that's just the difference of that buzz pollination versus a foraging behavior. Um, bumblebees also lack a bit of a sophisticated, they have a communication system, but they lack a really sophisticated uh, communication system. So they're not telling each other, oh, hey, there's a crop of dandelions over in the ditch over there. It's way more tasty than these blueberries here. Let's all go over there. Some might head over there and do some pollination, but for the most part, they're not moving en masse to these other more attractive flowers. They're just kind of going flower by flower as they come to them pollinating. 
They're also more focused on pollen in contrast to nectar. And that comes down to they're not going to be overwintering as an entire colony, so they don't need to be gathering tons of nectar for that process. Um, and with that, you get a high pollen transfer to each of the pistils with every visit. And in general, bumblebees do promote a bit higher rate of cross-pollination and visit about twice as many blooms per minute in contrast to honeybees. By no means am I saying honeybees are no good, but uh, just as a contrast of some of the benchmarks that we know with, with pollinators in the field, bumblebees are doing about twice as many per minute in contrast to honeybees. Within a colony, we have a breakdown of, there's the queen, she's primarily doing all of the egg laying. We have the foragers, which are all female, and they are foraging for pollen and nectar. You've got the workers, which are pretty well all females too, and they're staying within the hive. They're feeding the larvae, protecting the nest, doing the chores at home. The drones, they develop later, and those are all males, and their primary role is reproduction. The brood itself is the whole group of the developing larvae, and they are very critical because they are the driving force of all the worker worker bees and that reason for pollination. So if you have an unhealthy brood for whatever reason, that will lead to poor pollination into the crop because it gives if there's if there's a very small brood in there or just not very many babes to actually be feeding, the workers are going to be working to feed the brood that's existing, not necessarily, oh, there's hundreds of flowers here that need to be pollinated. They're focused on their their next generation. And the larvae, those are the individuals within the brood. For their development, they do need quite a large amount of pollen as a food source for proper development. Now in nature, I contrast with this because we're really mimicking what happens in nature with these commercial hives. So in nature, a bumblebee queen hibernates alone over winter and underground. So when the spring temperatures come up, that queen wakes up and her first job is to start foraging for pollen and nectar and be looking for a suitable nest site. Once the nest site is chosen, she's gonna start laying eggs to build her own colony. And within about four weeks from those first eggs, the first worker bees, which are all females, they start to emerge and they're carrying out work both inside and outside of the nest. The worker bees, they're foraging for the pollen and nectar. They are completely providing all of those resources for the brood um, and performing the maintenance on the jobs of, of, within the jobs of the nest itself. And then as the nest continues to develop, the queen is no longer leaving it. She's staying inside, tending to the babes, continuously laying eggs and giving worker uh, orders to those worker bees. In late summer, the queen is going to start producing some new queens and male drones in order for that colony to reproduce. So there's a trigger that happens with time, size of colony, colony that tells the queen, okay, it's ready, we're ready, I need to have another queen, another several queens for reproduction for that dormancy period that's upcoming. So when those new queens leave the nest, they go mate with the males, and then they're going to find a place to hibernate over winter, and then that cycle just continues. The old queen does not overwinter again, she and her nest will decline naturally in late autumn and that's it, they're done. So only the mated female is overwintering in bumblebees in Canada. So, oh, just go back one, there it is. So within the greenhouse, um, when we're using these commercially, what we want to do is place the hives into the crop about four to seven days before the flowering begins. That allows them to settle. They don't really love being on trucks transported around, so it gives them a chance to settle, um, tend to the brood. And basically, as soon as you start seeing flowers available, they'll go and pollinate those. So when we're placing it into the greenhouse, we wanna have optimal visibility. This is both for us humans to tend to the hives, but mostly for the, the foragers to be able to go leave the, leave the colony and be able to find their way back. 
So for optimal visibility, you want to place the colonies on the pathways. Um, and this, the pathway, you can kind of think of it as like a landing strip for the bees where they can really easily differentiate the pathway from the rest of the crop, improving the orientation so that they can easily come home. Now we want to make sure that we provide some shade from direct sunlight, especially when it's quite hot and protection from moisture. In the greenhouse, a lot of times, if your hive is placed directly below the gutters, you can have some condensation coming off of the plastic or the glass that will drip down. And we don't really want those drips to be getting into the hives. It just makes it very uncomfortable for everybody. When we place them within the crop, it's best to do an even distribution because they are you know, flying more closely to their brood. If you place them evenly throughout the crop, you're gonna have more even distribution throughout that greenhouse. And just make sure that when you're placing them, they are not sitting crooked because at the bottom of each of these colonies is actually a bladder of sugar water for their hydration. Tomatoes don't have a whole heck of a lot of nectar, so if we didn't provide extra sugar water for them, they wouldn't have enough hydration in that particular crop. So make sure that it's always sitting flat because there's a wick in there, and if it's crooked and it's not touching, well, they're out of water. <clears throat> so the quantity of hives that you're going to need within a crop, it really depends on the crop type because it could depends on the number of those flowers produced and the presence of other pollinators. So for easiness, you know, beef, beef tomatoes produce less flowers per truss in contrast to cherry or grape type tomatoes. So you'll likely need a bit more hives in the cherry types because of the number of flowers in contrast to beef tomatoes. Makes sense. When you're in spring and summer growing conditions, it's best to place the hives on the south side of the pathway, but low down closer to the ground, about eight to 24 inches, because the crop itself will give natural shade throughout the day with that kind of a placement. But if we are doing any winter growing, we want to put them a bit higher up, roughly four or five feet from the, from the ground. And that allows for uh, better sunlight earlier in the day by placing them up high like that so that when the sun is lower, we place those hives higher up so that when it does finally hit horizon, the bees are able to see that natural light and start getting to work. And relative humidity does matter for sure with this, more so for pollen release. We want to see uh, somewhere between 50 to 80% relative humidity so that the pollen is still available for the bees. Now, placing them throughout the greenhouse, that is the best way to do, uh, but sometimes we do have to group them together. If we do that, it's best to avoid more than two together. And you can put them either horizontally or vertically, vertically meaning stacked, but when you do stack them, make sure that the doors are facing opposite directions from each other and away from the crop. So you've got, you know, four different ways that you could place it. Well, you can place it happily three different directions because only one direction is going to be facing the crop along the walkway there. Do keep in mind though, if we stack those hives, there is ventilation holes all around them. So if you're stacking them, especially in warm weather, you're increasing the overall heat that's in that area. So you might on very, very hot days, not be doing the bees a favor by stacking them. If we're doing a horizontal placement, so we're placing them side by side, the entrances can be in the same direction, but you still want to point them away from the crop and don't put more than about three hives together just so that they can actually find which one that they belong to. If all things are good, you don't really have to do a whole heck of a lot of hive maintenance once they're in the greenhouse. It's more or less open the door, the flowers are present, they're going to go and forage. You as a grower don't really have to do a whole heck of a lot as long as that climate is nice for them. Now, if we're in an outdoor situation, uh, we do have a different design that we use for outdoor and we call them quads because these are four colonies placed together and they're a little bit larger. Um, primarily we're targeting early spring bloom periods with the, this particular one. So they have some, there's a water repellent cover that comes onto them. So we don't need to be as mindful of moisture coming down from the top, 
but we do want to still protect them from excessive heat. If it's early spring, not so much of a concern, especially when temperatures are on the lower side. But if it's, you know, say a, a later blooming crop, we do need to provide some shade for them, but you can often use whatever the crop is to provide that shade. In the outdoor, we wanna put them up on a pallet just to keep them, you know, not from sitting in puddles and that sort of a thing, easy enough. And that way it makes it nice and flat because again, there's still sugar water in the bottom of these as well. And the main thing as well is protecting against wind. So we've seen this time and again in the spring, you get some really strong winds and they pick up the quads and flip them over and the bumblebees will not be pollinating your crop if they are flipped over in the field. So when we are working with them together with honeybees, um, not really common in a greenhouse situation to be combining these, but somewhat in the field. And if we are using these in some mixed crops, it's good to be mindful of these two together. They work fine together, as long as we keep them a little bit apart. So if you have both colonies in the field, just try to keep a minimum distance of about 100 meters between the two. Uh, because there will be some sugar water theft because we provide it within the, the colony of the honeybees, especially in early spring when there's not a whole lot of food water resources kicking around. The honeybees might try to get into those bumblebee colonies to steal the provided sugar water. So just keeping a nice distance apart. Otherwise, they're pretty happy to coexist. With climate in the field, of course, we have to be mindful of that. Um, we want the bees to be focused primarily on the job of pollination. So we need to be providing them a climate that allows for them to do that. So when we're about eight to 11 degrees, 10 being the average, um, that's when bumblebees are gonna start foraging uh, and actively pollinating your crop. If we are cooler than that, what's really gonna happen is the bumblebees are gonna stay inside the colony uh, and they're going to work to incubate the brood because the brood has to stay warm. And if they don't, you know, if they don't stay in there keeping the brood warm, then their whole purpose for gathering pollen kind of goes out the door. If it's extremely hot, they're also going to stay inside the brood and uh, inside with the brood. And what they're gonna do is beat their wings in there to provide ventilation so that they can try to cool off those developing larvae. Now, if it's just a single day of unfavorable conditions, you're likely not gonna have any massive impact. But if you're going several days, that brood needs to be fed pretty consistently for optimal development. So the longer those unfavorable conditions persist, the greater impact you'll see with the bumblebees on their performance later on. This chart I find sums it up really quite perfectly. So you've got right in the middle, your 12 to 28 degrees Celsius, that's your happy spot for everybody. You've got good pollination activity, the brood is healthy and doing their development stages, the adults are going out, they're foraging, they're tending to the brood. Once you start getting on those other sides of the temperature of 12 to 28, things start to reduce, the pollination activity starts to reduce, and then you start getting further and further on the outside of that, and you'll see no pollination happening because really the adults are gonna be staying inside, taking care of the brood, trying to make sure that their next generation has as little damage as possible in those unfavorable conditions. That being said though, if your average 24 hour temperature is about 15 degrees Celsius, you shouldn't have too, too much negative impact going on because even if it goes down to five degrees overnight, but then we have the warm temperatures to balance it throughout the day, we're in the happy zone. The relative humidity effect on pollination, this isn't so much necessarily for the bumblebees complaining about, oh, it's so humid, I don't like it. This is more about the pollen release itself. So the relative humidity needs to be between about 50 to 80% on average. If you're growing up higher than 80% relative humidity, you might have very sticky pollen, and that is difficult for the anthers to actually let it go. Um, and so what you might see if you are in that very high relative humidity for quite some time, 
especially in a tomato crop, it's really easy to see this. The, what you'll see is it looks like it's been very heavily pollinated because they're latching on. They're trying to do that buzz pollination, but no pollen is actually falling out because it's too sticky. And so the bees keep trying to gather, keep trying to gather. The pollen, the, the flower itself has lots of bruise marks, but you're still not seeing pollination. It's probably related to a high relative humidity and that sort of a thing. Now you go on the opposite extreme, um, relative humidity below 50%. What you'll likely see is uh, the, the stigma is too dry for the pollen to actually germinate. So you might have contact, but there's not enough moisture for germination to actually happen for that, for fertilization to actually take place. The relative humidity optimum, 70%. So if we can be somewhere around there, again, you're not having too many issues then. Of course, we do have challenges in the field that I wouldn't be employed if it was always easy. Um, sometimes there's challenges in the field. So if bumblebees that don't have access to flowers for pollen for a long period, we'll need to go in and feed them. Um, we have pollen that we feed them regularly in production and that we can send out to growers in the field if there's something funny going on like that to just manually feed them at that point. Um, one of the ones that I've come into in my experience with poor lighting, it can lead to some disorientation where the bees become lost and they can't get back to the brood because they really need the UV for orientation. If we are in a situation like that, which is kind of rare, um, it's better to actually just close the hives and feed pollen during those periods of extremely low light to avoid losing bees that are disoriented. Now, in my experience, this usually is a rare occasion that happens in greenhouses, in winter growing, with lights on, snow load on the roof, and energy curtains closed. So we kind of have a perfect storm of very, very low UV in those types of situations. So it's not your typical every day, uh, December through November growing period. It's, it's special to the winter period. If we have CO2 pipes in the greenhouse, please don't put the hives right beside this. Um, it will poison them eventually, slow, slow poison death. So just keep it away from the CO2 pipes. It doesn't have to be ridiculous, like just a few feet away from the CO2 pipes. Um, and one of the other things that we might see in the field, it, it's going to be greenhouse by greenhouse, field by field. Um, you might see some pests that are attracted to the sugar water within that hive. That's another reason for keeping them up off of the ground on either a hive stand or whatever, just to get them up off of the ground a bit. Uh, ants, really common to go after that sugar water, but if they're up on a hive a stand of some sort, you can always easily just wrap some sticky tape or something like that around it as a deterrent. Um, one that I always kind of makes me giggle and it's a true thing is bears in spring season will go after the quads once they're in the field because they're interested in the larvae and in some situations we actually have to put electrical fencing around them. Okay. Hopefully that's not happening in your greenhouse though. <laughs> so when we, uh, we've got the bees in there, everything is happy. How do we actually evaluate successful pollination? Um, well, they've gone on, they've latched on to the bees, they've done, or the flowers, they've, they've done the buzz pollination, they've gathered the pollen, and we can really easily see this in tomato flowers after the fact. It takes a couple of hours for this bruising to appear, but you'll see basically just little, uh, two little teeth marks, essentially, where the mandible, mandibles have grabbed onto the flower to shake the flower. And we can assess how good the pollination is. Do we need a bit more bumblebees? Do we need less? According to those bruising marks that we see in the flower. And uh, you can kind of just use a grading system of one bite. Well, we might want a little bit more than one bite. We know that we know that pollination has been successful with one visit, but we want to maybe see two or three bites on each flower just so that if it does get hot or unfavorable conditions, we know that we have enough pollinators in there. So basically when it comes to tomatoes, you're going through and taking a look at the flowers, looking for visible bite marks. And if we see that throughout, we're good. Strawberries are a little bit different for an assessment. They're not as easy as a tomato flower, but uh, you can see with the pistils 
on the strawberry flower there, there's one on the left that's been pollinated. The one on the right is a fresh open flower waiting to be pollinated. So we need to have each pistil pollinated for evenly shaped fruits with strawberries. Once they have been pollinated, the pistil starts to turn brown and that will indicate a pollen transfer. You want to see pretty uniform browning of these pistils within each flower. If we have poor pollination in strawberries, you will see some misshapen fruits, but not all misshapen fruits are caused by pollination. <clears throat> Hit the next slide, there we go. Uh, so just a nice example for strawberries. On the left, poor pollination, really wonky, lumpy type growth. In the middle, Beautiful, perfectly marketable. You can see that the seeds are evenly distributed, even uniform size. And then on the right there, that is a deformity caused by ligus, a tarnished plant bug that takes bites into the, into the fruits. And you'll get the deformities caused by ligus looking, to me, they look quite a bit different than a poor pollination, um, but it can be a little bit difficult sometimes in the field if you're just looking at misshapen fruits to identify, well, what what caused this? Um, in strawberry crops as well, boron deficiencies are known to cause some deform deformities, which is sometimes difficult to assess in contrast to pollination. So in summary, bumblebees are very effective poll uh, pollinators. They're native to Canada, so that makes it really nice for using them in the Canadian climate effectively. Uh, and they're super good at pollinating in a diligent way. Buzz pollination, the shorter flight distances, very large hairy bodies. We're not getting the slides refreshed. Shall I keep going? Are, what are you seeing right now? I just had a comment from somebody that says the slides are not being refreshed. Ah! So what did you guys see? Oh, so you've got another comment that says it's good for me. So okay, good for one. Okay, we're on the last slide. So I'll just do the summary and hopefully, um, hopefully the person with refreshing uh, can watch. Oh, slide 21. That's odd. Okay. Um, well, we will send out the recording afterwards, Jillian. I'm not quite sure why we're stuck. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to see those photos and reference them um, once once we're posted, which will hopefully be by the end of the week if I'm on the ball. So <laughs> yeah, Andrea, if you just want to finish up, then we can. Uh... Yeah. Okay. So bumblebees, extremely effective pollinators native to Canada, which is lovely uh, and very good working within the Canadian climate between factors like buzz pollination, short flight distances very large hairy bodies, and a lack of a very sophisticated communication system. This helps us as growers pollinate with bumblebees for specifically the crops that they that we want them to be pollinating. Um, bumblebees can provide a really good solution for difficult flower structures by using that buzz pollination technique and also working in those cooler climates uh, when we've got uh, flowers pollinating in the early, early season when there's not a lot of other pollinators around to do the job for us. Really, the, from the bumblebee's perspective, all of the foraging is driven primarily by the health of the brood. So, of course, we have to always be mindful of that brood that's developing. And another advantage is that bumblebee's colonies, you can get them at any time throughout the year. So it doesn't, if we're in a protected crop, whether it's winter growing or not, we can get bumblebees available to you regardless of the time of the year in protected crops. That's it. <laughs> All right, so I'll just pop your um, information up here and maybe we can start addressing some questions. Yeah. Um, so how can we source supplemental pollen um, and what's the best way to feed the bees? So, for our bees, we just, we if you want supplemental pollen, we have some that you can purchase. Um, it just come in a little baggie. It's usually about a tablespoon every couple of days uh, or a smaller amount every single day. Um, and 
with the hive design when you open when you open the cardboard box there's actually a, a plastic cage within it and it's slatted so that you can actually just put the pollen right on top of those slats and the bees inside will come in and grab it down to feed the brood um are you guys doing any work with flying doctor type hives and um, we've heard that the bee vector bavaria is effective in botrytis prevention Yes, we have done some work with that. It's been quite some time that we did any work with it. Um, overall, and that my memory's a little bit foggy on this, but overall, uh, the trials we found weren't advantageous enough to be doing. So products like that can irritate the bees because they don't want to be flying around with products like Bavaria all over their legs. And for the most part, I'm recalling this from memory, but the actual botrytis control within the field was not enough to stop other methods of, of botrytis controls as well. So it was just basically what we found an added thing that had to be managed and with no significant advantage into the field. I'd love to hear otherwise if this is working for anybody, but the trials that we've done aren't showing a major economic advantage or time saver for anybody. Um, I have a few questions. Um, okay, so we, you touched a little bit on the fact that like tomatoes require sort of that vibration um, mm -hmm. in order to kind of grab that pollen. So like do all flying insects equal pollinators or? <laughs> yeah. And maybe it gets crop dependent. Um, no, not all flying insects equal pollinators but many, many insects feed on pollen and nectar as well. Um, so by they might bump into some and do some accidental pollination. Uh, I mean, even mosquitoes could be considered pollinators if you think about it, but we're not, they're not really working as diligently in the field to get even crop distribution. Um, but yeah, there, there's, there's plenty of insects that we could call pollinators out there. But if they're not doing it in the way that we want to see it, like as growers for uniformity, um, you're going to get some benefit for sure. You'll get some benefit of native pollinators, but I wouldn't consider necessarily all of them to be pollinators from a commercial standpoint. Okay, awesome. Um, what about pollination in the rain? Like how how are bees impacted by by that? And so I'd like you to answer that maybe from like the outdoor perspective. And then do we also see that? indoors yep. as well. Well, if it's heavy rain, they're not going to fly. They're, they won't yep. be able, the water droplets are going to just bog them down. Um, very light, like misting type rain, they'll probably go out a little bit and not fly very far. Um, but overall, no, if it's, if it's like a rainy day, you're probably not going to see a whole lot of stuff in the field itself. In the greenhouse, yes, they will be performing. Um, as long as there's enough UV coming through, and which there typically is, I mean, it's got to be really raining to be uh, completely stopped inside the greenhouse. If there's lights on in the greenhouse, that will help assist them as well. Um, but for the most part, yeah, inside the greenhouse, they're happy to keep on going. You might see activity reduced, but it won't be completely gone unless it's really dark. Really bad. Okay. Um, and how many hives do you recommend basically like per greenhouse space okay um so in a strawberry house you would be looking at on average one hive for every one to two acres but you're going to have flushes within a green within the strawberry crop so then you want to increase the hives for that flush period um so that again might depend on the flower type that you're growing um in tomatoes, usually it's broken down by the type. So beef would be using a little bit less than, say, cherry. We actually develop um, hive introduction schedules so we can get really specific with what the actual crop is to do it correctly. And off of the top of my head, uh, on a tomato house, let's call it beef because I remember that one, you're using one hive for every one to two acres of greenhouse area per week because we want to be putting them in steadily 
every hive colony is going to come in at a certain size, it's going to develop and grow, and then it's going to naturally decline a little bit. So by plying them in a larger area every single week, you avoid these ups and downs with pollination and keep it really steady in a steady flowering crop. We wouldn't do that necessarily in a strawberry crop. You would time it with your flushes. So it's it's not sorry, it's not a straightforward answer. It really does depend on the number of flowers produced. Um, but if you were just kind of getting into it, try a hive for an acre, and then you can uh, work with the hive itself, opening, closing, feeding if it gets a little bit if they need some more food sort resources. Um, okay, so then if you if we don't have an acre space, are we still okay to do one hive or is it sort of like that is the minimum? Uh, no, you can do it in smaller spaces too. Uh, anything that's smaller than about a quarter acre is going to get difficult to manage. Um, but anything smaller like that is totally fine, um, especially if they are able to go outside and just grab some pollen from native flowers that are around the property as well. Um, but if you're in a quite a small zone, you probably would benefit if the pollination is getting quite heavy because we don't we don't want the bees to do damage to the flowers either trying to grab resources that they're just desperate for we can just feed supplemental pollen every few days to reduce them from starving out at that point too okay interesting or if you maybe if you have multiple spaces next to each other that are open to the environment right like if they're sort of always vented then you could kind of place in between tunnels and kind of Absolutely. Okay, Absolutely. Awesome. And actually in tunnels, um, it's spring venting when the dandelions start coming and we need to start venting the greenhouse a little bit you will absolutely see dandelion pollen coming back on the legs of those bumblebees because it is delicious in contrast to some of the flowers that we provide for them. <laughs> and then I guess some no issues with, you know, having vents open and allowing those bees to leave and find their the way back. Yeah, there, well, there can be a little bit of an issue if we are venting and then it's starting to get closer to the evening and the UV is coming down and the workers haven't returned yet. Uh, but there's some strategies to play with your venting to ensure that we close the vents up in time prior to dusk. Sorry, how does it work? There is a strategy to do this to make sure that your venting time is in in relation to when the bees are coming back and forth because usually it's only about a couple of hours that the bees are going out and then they return so trying to time your venting with that but during spring venting we can expect to see some bees go out vents close and they don't come back mm -hmm. okay i if yeah if you wouldn't mind digging that up that could be kind of an interesting piece to send out in the follow-up email potentially yeah um yeah I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, I've got another one here for you. Um, are there any issues with hives facing a certain compass direction or are we fair game just to point it where we want it? Yeah, it, the the compass is, uh, well, they could discover something like this one day and prove me wrong. <laughs> but the compass direction is not as necessary. Um, if it is winter growing, you can face the door uh, pointing towards the rising sun and that will help them wake up a little bit in the morning but mm -hmm. otherwise it doesn't really matter I prefer seeing however your walkway is oriented that the doors are facing the walkway because it makes easy for us to be managing them and then they can easily come in and out but it's more when it's orientation that way it's more about having the walkway as a, a landmark a, a, something for them to recognize okay. and then be so, okay, this is where the colony is, as opposed to you know, the 95% of the area that's just covered in crop to the bee, it all kind of looks the same. Okay. Yeah. No, that's, that makes sense. Um, and then I'll just have one final question for you. So you talked a bit about like bee aggression, yes. <clears throat> how they're typically not aggressive. What are some things that would cause them to be aggressive? Yeah, uh, starvation, number one. So if they are hungry, they are going to get aggressive. So basically that comes down to matching what the hives are needed in like within the crop for the number of flowers. If they are running out of resources, they'll get aggressive. Um, pesticide incompatibilities might cause some aggression because they start getting cranky about that. And they don't like some certain scents 
Uh, I know that chewing minty gum is not a great idea when you're working around bees. It kind of irritates them a little bit. Those are the top, actually starvation and pesticides are pretty well the top two that cause aggression within the greenhouse. But is, if everything is happy, they shouldn't really bother you. I can honestly say for like the past 14 years that I have worked for Copert, I have been stung three times where I was not provoking them purposefully. It's pretty, it's a pretty good record. <laughs> almost rarely wear my bee suit unless I'm going in there to mess around with them. I almost never wear the bee suit because I don't need to. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and then we just have a comment here. So they've successfully used hives in tomato greenhouses as small as 20 by 60. Um, awesome. the bees outside. Yeah. So, and similar to say, right? Like, oh, like that strategic venting, closing the house at night um, and just... Yeah, really kind of cycling to their daily routine and making sure they get home in time. So that's that's some great feedback. That's awesome that you can do it on such a small, like a small area without any issue. That's beautiful. And we've we've had some good sort of anecdotal evidence of people who have just purchased a hive to give it a shot. And they found that it was significantly better quality pollination, more uniform, like the fruits were just ripening around the same size. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so that's that's also awesome to see. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna finish us off here. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Are you seeing the notes? No, I am not, but I see my face. Oh yeah, there don't, we go. There we go. We're just going to keep it on a picture of you for the next four minutes. <laughs> um, so I just have a few photos of kind of that feeding that we were talking about. I thought this was kind of a nice side by side. So, um, you know, we talk about monitoring feeding and I think it's easy to be excited at the beginning when we first toss our bees in and be like, oh, my gosh, feeding. Um, but I I think it's safe to say this is probably something we should be keeping an eye on throughout the entire season, especially for something that does flower continuously. Um, so that first circle that popped up, we're just looking at something that hasn't been visited yet. So if you're seeing that the majority of your flowers look like this, um, there might be an issue with your hive. Um, this is sort of like a medium visited. I think this might be kind of that multiple bites that you were referring to so you can kind of see that browning happening on the cone there and then we've kind of got this like full-on dark very whether that was pollination or another issue but you're going to see like a very dark cone there mm -hmm. um, that might be an indication that your bees are very hungry or there's high visitation so maybe they need to go outside in that scenario or what would you suggest if you were seeing that level of first first thing i would look at is um how many of the flowers are looking in this condition? Because if it's mm -hmm. a small sample, then it might be something else. But if it's consistent throughout the crop, then I would probably go, okay, how many hives do we have in here in contrast to flowers? That yep. would be the first thing. And then on something specifically like that, I would be looking at what's the humidity because mm -hmm. that looks like a classic example of the humidity is too high. The pollen is in there. The bees know it's in there, but it will not release. So they keep going back, trying to, to make it release. And it's not, um, it's not getting there. So that, that one with the really aggressive, we would call that over pollinated. Yeah. And if you peel that back a little bit and look at the pistol inside, if there's bruising and damage on the pistol, then the fruit is maybe going to develop. Probably not. And so then you've got an, a different kind of an issue going on. Mm. So, and you mentioned it got really, like the pollen gets really sticky at a high humidity, correct? Exactly. So that's, they're really just trying to beat it out of the flower in a sense. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And so could you close the hive for a few, like, is that a thing? Maybe just like re slow down the release of bees if that's, if you're finding this overactivity. Yeah. Either feed them for sure. Feed yeah. them supplements of pollen. Um, you can close the hive to give the flowers a break, um, but you could also leave it open and be feeding too, but you need to be monitoring daily when you're doing, when you're into a situation like that, you need to check every single day. You can change pollination levels fairly quickly if you're managing it properly, um, but we definitely don't want to go multiple days with flowers getting beat up like that. 
Yeah, no, it'll be a nice blank spot sort of along that cluster height in your crop, I think, if you see that happening. Yep. Yep. Yeah, you will definitely see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is everything that we have today. I'll just double check the chat to make sure that nothing else has cropped up. Awesome. Okay. Um, yes. So thank you so much, Andrea, for coming and sharing all of your knowledge. Um, I will go out on a limb and say you guys are welcome to reach out to her and ask any questions you may have. Um, also very good with beneficials, um, not just bees. So yeah, a wealth of knowledge sort of in the insect realm. Um, and yes, I look forward to seeing you May 1st. We are going to be switching to the 7.30 a.m. time slot as opposed to 8.30, just as we are sort of getting going earlier in the day. Um, so hopefully that's not too painful. And yeah, we'll be talking about uh, biological spray programs for strawberry and tomato.